welcome to Modern Health Span, and thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's my joy and pleasure. Very happy to be here. Thank you. So I'm really interested in talking to you today about meditation because it's it's a recommended practice to relieve stress, and stress is one of the big things that can kind of shorten our lives and make shorten the health span, particularly. But it's not clear how to check whether you're doing it right or not. And, uh, you know, Muse makes a device which helps measure that and helps guide you. So certainly would like to get into that and how that works. But kind of to start off with, can you tell me kind of what led you into neuroscience? What, why was that what you uh, kind of studied and, and built the company around? Oh, it's funny when you ask that. It's like, well, why wouldn't everybody want to study <laughs> neuroscience? Why wouldn't you want to know what goes on in your brain and how it mm. works? So I was fascinated by the brain and both how it creates our psychological experience of life and how it creates our functional experience of life, being able mm. to see and feel and walk and breathe. And I went to school for neuroscience and then uh, trained as a psychotherapist and was a psychotherapist in private practice. Um, at the same time, continuing to work in the field of neuroscience. And I began collaborating with somebody called Steve Mann. He's the inventor of the wearable computer. And he mm. was experimenting with brain computer interfaces. And uh, we began to use these brain computer interfaces to uh, create a sound or light response to shifts in your brain state. So when you would focus, mm. you could hear the sound get louder. When you were relaxed, the sound would change. And that allowed us to begin to have a way that we could actually make the intangible workings of the mind more tangible. You could actually literally hear or see when you're focused and when your mind is wandering. And that mm. became the predecessor to Muse. So from there, we were actually able to make a device and experience that would consistently let you know when you're focused and when your mind is wandering. Oh, when was that? When, when did you build the first one of these? Okay, so I started working with uh, Dr. Mann in 2002, wow. um, 2001, 2002. We were doing experiments in the lab and creating experiences. We began, we continued working with the technology sort of 2005, six, seven. By 2007, we're like, okay, this is, this is important. We can bring this out into the world. The world needs to know about it. Um, by 2010, we did a large experience at the Olympics allowing people to interact with things with their brain and see the experience of being focused and relaxed. And then by 2012, we had our first product designed. The first Muse was designed mm -hmm. into a slim little headband that could actually work. And then from there, 2014, we came to market with Muse as a meditation tool. So in November, 2014, you could buy a brain sensing headband that would help you meditate in Best Buy. I mean, that was really early, especially your, your, your early work, like in the early 2000s, uh, which is amazing. Could we talk about meditation in general? So what is, what is meditation and, and how does it differ from kind of mindfulness? Sure. So meditation has many def definitions depending on the tradition that you're coming out of. The secular definition of meditation that I use is meditation is simply a practice or a training that leads to healthy and positive mind states. So it's a thing that you do regularly that makes your brain and your mind healthier. So a simple meditation practice may be a focused attention practice. You put your attention on your breath, your mind wanders away, you notice it, and you return it to your breath. So it's a very simple exercise that ends up training both your brain, the, the muscle of your brain, the meat, there's no actual muscle fibers in there, but the meat of your brain, and it ends up training your mind the way that you mm -hmm. think. You know, people often confuse the idea of meditation and mindfulness, and, and that's okay. <laughs> Many <laughs> Most people don't know how to define it, but meditation is the practice, the thing that you do regularly, um, like go, the going to the gym. And mindfulness is the skill that is built. So in the gym example, the skill that you're building when you're at the gym, part of it is strength and awareness of your body. So in meditation, what you're doing is you're building the skill of mindfulness, which is being able to non-judgmentally be aware of your thoughts, feelings, the environment um, at any given moment in time. So that is the act of being mindful. 
And you might hear uh, meditations called mindful meditation or mindfulness meditations. And those are meditations that are particularly good at generating the skill of mindfulness. So are there any physiological changes, either like short term, I mean, I guess to your hormones or, or to your, the chemicals, or kind of longer term in the brain or the body when you meditate? So there are now thousands of studies that have been conducted demonstrating the benefits of meditation. And many of those are quite astonishing physiological benefits. So um, one of the commonly cited studies on the benefits of meditation for stress and longevity comes from Alyssa Epfel and Elizabeth Blackburn. And they looked at uh, very stressed individuals. These were mothers who are caregiving for terminally ill children, like the stressful situations you can get. Mm -hmm. And they took a cohort of them and taught them mindfulness meditation. And then at the end, checked the length of their telomeres. I'm sure as your listeners know, people who, you know, listen often to you talk about longevity, you probably know that the telomere is like the little cap on the end of your DNA. It degrades over time. When it's gone, you've shortened your lifespan. Um, and it was then shown that in these very stressed individuals, their telomeres had gotten shorter and shorter and shorter. But by being taught a meditation practice, they're actually able to lengthen their telomeres. This is quite astonishing. This, this mm. act of meditation actually seemed to be reversing the cellular aging process. And this was one of the first sort of pivotal papers that showed that one's mental state, the thoughts that are in your mind, plus your level of stress, um, can actually dramatically impact your cellular milieu, all the chemicals that are floating around in your cells and in your body. And that by changing the thoughts in your mind um, from negative to positive to one of being out of control to one of being in control, you change your level of stress, but you also change your physiology, the actual chemicals floating around in your cells. And that can include being able to reverse cellular signs of aging, like increasing telomeres. That, that is pretty amazing. Do, do, you yes. see, <laughs> yeah, do you see any physiological, physiological change in the brain structure for people who, who meditate regularly? Okay, this is one of my favorite topics to talk about because <laughs> meditation has been demonstrated to make real positive and significant change in the brain, the structure of the brain itself. So um, bad news, as you age, your prefrontal cortex thins. The prefrontal cortex mm -hmm. is the part in the front, just behind your forehead, and it's responsible for our kind of higher order processing, our planning, our decision-making, our inhibition, our organization, organization of thoughts and things in the world. As you age, it thins, but Dr. Sarah Lazar from Harvard was able to show that if you maintain a long-term meditation practice, you can actually maintain the thickness of your prefrontal cortex even as you age. So she took a number of long-term meditators, put them in an MRI machine, compared them to controls, and she was able to demonstrate that uh, long-term meditators had prefrontal cortices that looked like a much younger person. There's one 50 year old who had a prefrontal cortex thickness of a 25 year old or so. So, you know, we're making real change. Meditation's also been demonstrated to downregulate the amygdala. The amygdala is the part of your brain that's always scanning for danger and is really the, the nexus of your um, brain-based fear response. So it scans for danger, looks for something, discovers it's fearful, decides it's fearful, even if it's not something that's actually threatening, then triggers your HPA axis, um, hypo hypothalamus, adrenal, pituitary axis, hmm. HPA. Um, down that HPA axis, it stimulates cortisol, which then rushes throughout your body and gives you all of the negative effects of stress. The positive hmm. effects being the like burst in energy and the negative effects, the constriction of blood vessels, the racing of the heart, this spike in blood sugar, et cetera, et cetera. So meditation changes your brain. Now we were talking about cortisol. Cortisol has been demonstrated to decrease the size of your hippocampus. The hippocampus is the part of your brain associated with learning and memory. 
And in long-term meditators, they tend to maintain hippocampal volume more effectively. And this may be because the hippocampus is very sensitive to cortisol. So cortisol can cause shrinkage of the hippocampus, the part that's so important for learning and memory. And a long-term meditation practice by decreasing your cortisol levels may be able to actually um, preserve your hippocampal volume. There's awesome. so many more ways that meditation changes the brain, but let's adjust that those for a couple of minutes. Yes. Now that, that was really interesting. Uh, so when you're meditating, so you have different brain waves, right? And and kind of mm -hmm. simplistically, it's like alpha, beta, and so could you talk about the brain waves and how how clear is it? I mean, is there like a clear change? Because I assume that's what your device measures, but can you talk a little bit about how those brain waves are visible? Sure. So let's start first talking about what brain waves are. Mm. So when you think or do anything mental, your brain waves change. And your brain waves are the sum total of the electrical ac chemical activity inside your neurons. So neurons communicate from one to another by sending an electrochemical signal. So uh, an electrical signal, which is translated into a chemical signal, which is then into an electric signal again. You don't have to worry about the details. And the sum total of this electrical stimulation can be read from the surface of the head. It creates an electrical field. So when you shift from thinking intensely and looking at things and generating, when you're doing that, you're in a high brainwave state. You're in a typically in a beta state, and that can be all the way up to 35 hertz, um, sort of 15 to 35 hertz we tend to think of as beta. And... When you then downregulate into a calm focus state, um, you've decreased the length, of, you've decreased the speed of your brainwave activity. And you've typically done that in specific areas of your head. So this is also a, a bit of a misnomer because people are like, oh, well, your brainwaves change globally. Well, different parts of your brain are exerting um, or emitting brainwaves at different frequencies. So when you're really focused, for example, you'll see frontal midline in the front here, theta activity, very, very slow wave activity. When you're about to, when you close your eyes, you see an increase in alpha activity. It's called the alpha block. And that can be read um, at the back of the head. And that brain, that wave travels across the head this way. So we have different brain waves in our head at every different moment, but globally, as you are focusing, you're in beta, as you're relaxing, that tends to, and focusing, to actually similar activities, uh, similar brain waves in those activities. So when you're relaxing and focusing, you see an increase in alpha activity, which is a slower wave. When you're daydreaming, um, you can see theta activity, which is even slower. And then when you're in deep sleep, sleep and deep sleep, you're going to see delta activity. Um, and those are extremely slow. Um, so that's the range of brain waves that you see. And you're right, when you meditate, there's a shift in brainwave activity and you see an increase in alpha activity, um, some theta activity, some coherence. Um, and those changes are what we are detecting with Muse while you meditate. I hadn't, I'd never thought about it before, but so your brain is full of neurons, but they must mm -hmm. be, and they communicate, right? By axons, by sending signals to each other, but they do that in pulses. There must be, there must be some kind of global organization that is organizing them to do this in pulses. The, you are absolutely right. So this is one of the theories of consciousness. So you have neurons communicating with one another, sending a pulse, um, and they do that by, they have little gated channels that allow ions, sodium mm. and chloride, potassium to go back and forth um, inside the neuron. And that change in ionic movement from the outside of the neuron to the inside to the axon and dendrite is the thing that then changes the polarity inside of the mm -hmm. axon, which then moves the signal, the electrical signal down to open the next gate so that mm -hmm. more ions flow in, which opens the next gate so that more ions flow in. So it's electrochemical. Mm -hmm. And this happens in an extraordinary concert. It, Scientists don't entirely know how the brain is able to regulate and organize itself so effectively. 
And it's a network of billions of neurons interconnected, um, both toggling on and off signals going back and forth. Some signals are inhibitory, some signals are excitatory, and overall it creates this experience of existence. You know, this is the big mystery that neuroscience has not yet solved. And we have some theories about it. You know, some theories of consciousness say that there is kind of a global brain wave that happens that binds it. And that's part of why it's so powerful when you're able to drop into a sleep state, for example, when you're in deep sleep and much of your brain is pulsing with this one big slow delta wave. So you have like this, you know, one, one or two hertz slow, big wave going through your whole brain and in a sense, organizing it and binding it in that way. Whereas during the day you're moving throughout, shifting quickly throughout different brain states at different, in different parts of your brain. And that is creating a different sort of organization, but not the same as the kind of global harmonious experience that happens during sleep, which may be part of why sleep is so restorative. It's restorative for many, many, many reasons, mm -hmm. um, but it may be that this driving global brainwave has something to do with it. Now, meditation is a state where, again, much of your brain is focused on a single thing. You've lowered the brainwave activity and you've created a certain amount of coherence. So instead of brainwaves scattering all over the place, they're all moving in sync. And that may be part of why meditation is so beneficial for your mind and body.